generations to come. Well, the Belmont Stakes is in the books, and so is the 2023 Triple Crown. And that's what we'll be talking about today on the TDN Writers Room Podcast. My name is Bill Finley. I'm correspondent for the TDN. Also co-host the Down the Stretch Show with Dave Johnson on Sirius XM Radio. Hi, I'm Randy Moss with uh, NBC Sports and the Buyer Speed Figure team. Zoe Cabman here with First Racing, and it looks like I've got a touch of bedhead going on. I literally, well, I woke up hours ago, but I obviously have not taken a shower yet, so excuse the mop. I know you're jealous, Randy. Me too. Yeah, I've got a little bit yeah. going on on this side only. You probably can't tell. <laughs> You're excused, Zoe. I want to remind you that the podcast is brought to you each and every week by our good friends at Keeneland. Okay, so the Belmont Stakes and Jenna Antonucci, who will be on a little bit later on the podcast as the Green Group Guest of the Week, was obviously the star of the show along with Archangelo. But anyways, guys, the reason why this is going to go down as the most popular of the three triple crown races, the ones I think we will, the one we will be remembering five years from now when we're still on the podcast talking about, which we will be doing, I promise you that, is because of the story. This is one of the things we talk, we'll talk to Jenna Antonucci about a little bit later. It's no secret that horse racing desperately needed a feel good moment and boy, did this horse and the trainer, Jenna Antonucci, provide it. $35,000 yearling, trained by a female, trained by a, someone with a small barn, goes out and gets the job done. Not a lot lately have we had to smile about, Randy. Even on Belmont Day as well, there was a fatality. Let's not forget about that. It happened in the race after the Belmont Stakes. But wasn't it nice to actually have something to be happy about for a little while? Oh, yeah. And we'll, as you said, we'll hear more from Jenna a little bit later. What a great ambassador for the sport she has turned out to be and the plethora of interviews that she's had to do over the last 72 hours. And the horse is cool himself, you know. I mean, uh, he obviously wasn't as heralded as some of the other horses he was running against in the Belmont Stakes. But in watching the race on Saturday as a fan, un unusually for me, uh, and as someone who put a pretty sizable bet on tap at Trice, I was watching Tappet Trice. I was watching Angel of Empire. I was watching Hit Show. Uh, part of me was wondering why the heck they were being ridden from the four and a half furlong pole, but a little more on that later, maybe. And then I look over as they're literally under a drive with three eighths of a mile to go. And I look down and there's this horse, Archangelo, who's one off the rail, who's sitting there. And Javier Castellano is just absolutely chilly and waiting while the other horses are being ridden along. And I thought, this race is over. I mean, this horse is, cl is clearly got way more left in the tank. And it's it's tempting to write it off in part as a, as, a, uh, as a trip thing, because he got through inside, turning for home out uh, inside of National Treasure. But in watching the race over and over and making notes on it, Archangelo would have won the race if he had sat and waited and came around National Treasure at the top of the stretch, it didn't matter that he got through along the inside. There was just so much more left in the tank. He was so much more uh, responsive to Castellano, moved up a little bit, uh, made a nice little surge midway uh, really early on the back stretch to get a good position when he steered him off the rail. He was just a better horse in the Belmont Stakes, at least on Saturday than the other more celebrated horses he was running against. Yeah, guys, just an absolutely terrific outcome. This is the only outcome that horse racing needs at this very time is Jenna Antonucci, Archangelo, the horse they paid 35000 for, Jenna, who won her first grade one race, the, the whole story of it, the plan that came together. She's always been targeting this race. They put up 50 grand. He won the Peter Pan. You know, not just because I'm a woman, but it, it just gives everybody hope. And this is what horse racing needs at this time when we continue to shoot ourselves in the foot. We continue to argue and bicker and point fingers. This is exactly what we need. And we can't thank Jenna enough for getting on this national platform and, and not beating her own drum, but beating the drum for all of us. I think it's absolutely terrific. Yeah, another storyline, of course, was the jockey as well. And Randy mentioned the trip that Archangel got. I do agree with you, uh, Randy. I think the horse would have won uh, under virtually any circumstances if he had gone around. Uh, around. But let's not uh, de-emphasize uh, de or diminish the, the 
quality ride that Javier Castellano gave this horse. It was an absolutely perfect ride, cutting the corner, coming in on the inside. She says later, she uh, on when we talked to her, she thought the rail was dead. I, I thought that was an interesting observation, not something th that I saw. But here's another guy, a class act who came into this year having never won the Derby or the Belmont. He hadn't won the Preakness. And a guy who wasn't, you know, struggling, but it looked like he was kind of, you know, at the tail end of his career, not getting the kind of mounts or winning the kind of races that he had maybe six or seven years ago. And now he's the story among the jockeys, having won the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont and with an absolutely brilliant ride uh, in the Belmont Stakes. And it also brings up a very interesting possibility on Travers Day, Major and Archangelo are in the starting gate. Who's Javier riding? Your thoughts on Javier Castellano, Randy? Yeah, it, you know, I mean, what's the odds that this year you could have two Hall of Fame guys in the, I, I guess you could say in the twilight of their career. Certainly that's the case for John Velasquez, and it's sort of semi the case maybe for Javier Castellano in his mid-40s. Castellano having never won the Derby or the Belmont and Johnny Velasquez having never won the Preakness. All three of them had multiple opportunities to win all three races. And it all gets taken care of in one triple crown sequence that uh, the the odds against that would have to be would have to be staggering and it's it's just another uh example of how uh when you get to that level the very best jockeys in America if they're given the right horses to ride they get the job done and Castellano certainly did with Mage and also with Archangelo good rides both Wow, I didn't. I didn't even think about that. That's a that's a really cool statement. You only had to go a little bit into the rabbit hole <laughs> to get that one, Randy. That that's really cool. Johnny V and Javier, two of the classiest guys that you will find in the jocks room. Just just ask their families and their wives and their kids. They're good guys, and they are really really easy to work for. So. He wins a race. Uh, tap it trice. I was with you, Randy. I'm on him. I'll never be on him again. He can win without me. It's the only time I was on him. I thought Forte ran a remarkable race to finish where he did. It, it just seems like the race is never quite long enough for him. Is that possible? I mean, it's like he only ever gets into gear at about the 316th pole, no matter how far you run him. He could run him six furlongs, and I think it would be the same thing. I thought he ran terrifically. The top three really all ran well. Yeah, it, it, Forte wasn't really like that earlier in his career, but the Florida Derby and the Kentucky right. Derby were almost identical in that he yeah. was he was in contention, especially in the Belmont Stakes. He was only a couple of lengths off the pace in the first turn and early on the backstretch, and then suddenly he drops back. Uh, it looked like he was he was going to finish in the back half of the field. As the, as the horses reach the turn with about a half mile to run, under a ride and going nowhere. And then just as he did in the Florida Derby, he picks it back up again and comes trudging along. Um, I, I don't know why Luis Saez moved as early as he did on Tapit Trice. Initially, I gave him the benefit of the doubt because that horse, once he gets going, you really don't want to get in his way. Uh, but at the 5 8 pole, at the 5 eighths pole, Luis Saez slapped him on the shoulder. As I'm watching the head, I'm like, okay. And then when he moved outside of Angel of Empire, at the four and a half pole, uh, Flavian Pratt on Angel of Empire looks outside and sees Tappet Trice on the engine and says, well, I guess I got to go. And both horses were being ridden with more than a half mile left in the race. And then Hit Show went. And suddenly all these guys are acting like they got a flight to catch. And you look down and here's Javier Castellano sitting on the inside, just as chilly and just as patient as he can be and all the horse in the world. And okay, this race is over, you know, and that's exactly what happened. Tappet Trice did his thing, broke slowly from the gate, uh, was rushed up. Uh, just that's I guess that's just going to be him. And uh, I'm with you, Zoe. I'm, I've I've lost my last dollar on Tappet Trice. <laughs> all right. Let me throw a little cold water on this love affair with Forte that you guys have going on. Sure, he ran fine. But if Todd Pletcher was not using the 10-week layoff and the bruised foot uh, in the Kentucky Derby as an excuse beforehand, you don't get to use it afterwards. Uh, no. He's a good horse. Uh, you know, this thing where he does where he looks like he's idling and then, you know, punches in a little bit last eighth of a mile. Well, you know, he's got to overcome that. Uh, and, and it doesn't look like he has. 
I just think he wasn't good enough uh, on this day. And I still wonder if he's, you know, how well he's made that transition from two to three. I mean, he's far from a bum. I mean, he's won the Florida Derby, Fountain of Youth, and not second in the Belmont. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that he hasn't quite lived up to expectations. Tappa Trice, um, if he can't win the Belmont, you know, the race that was tailor made for him with everything we talked about with his breeding, his running style, the trainer who excels in the Belmont. Another one, you know, he's a very good horse. But, you know, is he, you know, a star? No. Is he one of the two or three best three-year-olds? Uh, probably not. But I, I want to uh, grab that conversation. Um, now we look forward, obviously, to the, the Haskell Travers, Pennsylvania Derby, Breeders' Cup Classic. The uh, three-year-old championship is completely wide open. Everybody's won one race. Um, Randy, who would you expect would be the best horse among this crop going forward? Um I, I I don't have a firm answer to that myself. I think Archangelo has as good a chance as anybody to to be the answer to that question. I would say choice A or choice B, Arabian Night or Arabian Lion would wow, be the good. two would be okay. the two that I think would be the horses to watch for the second half of the year. Um, Zoe would know much more about this than me, but I've heard nothing but rave reviews about the way Arabian Knight has been training in California. He apparently is is Bob's uh, first choice for the Haskell. And then Arabian Lion, I mean, I think if Arabian Lion had been entered in the Preakness, and I understand why he wasn't, but if he had been entered in the Preakness, he would have won the Preakness. Um, and he ran faster on Belmont Day than any of the three-year-olds did. I'll... I'll Albeit was at seven furlongs, but still, I mean, Arabian Lion is uh, is really clicking on all cylinders now. So I think it's a pretty strong one-two punch for Bob Baffert heading into the second half of the year. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if one of those two horses wind up being three-year-old champion when all said and done. I, I agree with you completely. And uh, yes, Arabian Night is going towards a Haskell. We'll take a little look at him in XBTV's Work of the Week a little bit later on. Um, Bob confirmed by text yesterday that he is, in fact, going to the Haskell if Arabian Lion doesn't make it. I mean, they're, they're two very good horses, and I get confused. So Bob just says they just call they, he just calls them Knight and Lion because otherwise it's just too confusing. So I'm just going to stay with that because I keep muddling them up. But they're good, very good. So, guys, let's get away a little bit from this year's Belmont Stakes and, and talk about something we addressed with David O'Rourke last week and um, the the where the 2025 Belmont Stakes may be uh, run. He said Saratoga was a possibility, and uh, now the Naira's come out with even stronger statements that they were looking to perhaps run the race there in 2025. I think that would be the coolest thing in the world. I at once thought, though, that nobody's brought up the distance of the race I think it has should be run at a mile and a quarter. You run a mile and a half race at Saratoga, you start on the turn. You know, you know, how are you going to do that? And there is precedent. The COVID Belmont was run at a mile and an eighth. So anyways, um, I just think that's a fascinating topic. And uh, boy, to see a triple crown race run at Saratoga would be really off the charts. Yeah, I, I, I'm more concerned about when it's going to be run than where it's going to be run. Right. Because I like we've talked about ad nauseum. I mean, this Triple Crown is just another example of, of how the spacing needs to be changed, right? I mean, so maybe that'll be the impetus for uh, for the move to space these races out. If you run the, the Belmont at Saratoga, um, may, maybe that'll be the first step toward that process. I don't know. I'm not holding my breath. I know that much. It would be terrific if it was run at Saratoga. That would be awesome. I could spend three months there instead of two. <laughs> be great. I want to remind you, the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. John Ebert of Blue Rose Farm. We'll hear from Jenna Antonucci a little bit later on. They purchased Archangelo for 35000 at Keeneland's 2021 September yearling sale, and he won the 155th running of the Belmont Stakes, making Jenna Antonucci the first woman to train a Belmont winner. Keeneland is home of the world's yearling sale, the energy, magic, and momentum of the September Yearling Sale returns September the 11th through the 23rd. Learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, 
This is a racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. Maximum security proves he's the real deal with a gate to wire win in the Florida Derby. Champion three-year-old. Maximum security has won the TBG.com Haskell Invitational. 11 triple digit bias. Maximum security. He smoked them in the cigar mile. Grade one winning four-year-old. Maximum security takes them all the way in the TBG Pacific Classic. Secure your mayor's future. Maximum security. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Coolmore. On Beaumont Stakes Day, the day that turned Justify into a superstar, Arabian Lion gave Justify his first grade one winner in the Woody Stevens Stakes. And that was from his first crop of three-year-olds. Arabian Lion ran a 109 by a speed figure, the fastest of any three-year-old this year. Meanwhile, also on Saturday right here at the Great Race Place, Adair Manor won her third graded stakes with a decisive win in Santa Anita's Santa Margarita stakes for her sire, Uncle Mo. But they weren't the only Coolmore sires to have a big race weekend. Munnings had a Belmont stakes weekend double when closing act took the Astoria stakes and L Street Lady won the Jersey Girl. On this week's edition of First Things First, I caught up with the chosen Vron who is at the mist of a seven race win streak. And they're off. And here comes the chosen Vron, just ambling up to the top pair. And the chosen Vron, cruise control, comes to get the lead at the top of the stretch. But what a performance from the chosen Vron, one of the best cowbreds we've seen in years. The Chosen Vron, an absolute crushing in the Thor's Echo. Myself and Doodle are off to find the Chosen Vron, who may be, quite simply, the best cowbred of all time. And if he's not the best of all time, he most certainly is the best of his time. Here he is, the little engine that could. He's looking at Doodle. Had a little bit of downtime with him when he was three, but uh, basically he's just got a heart of gold and uh, he's tough to beat. He just knows where the wire is and he wants to get there. And this, everybody that rides him loves him. And is this one of your favorite horses? This is my favorite horse. <laughs> is he easy to gallop, Jacob? Uh, he's pretty, pretty, pretty tough guy, but you know, I don't give you no intentions to get tough. But he's honest, honest guy, you know, he don't, he don't, he's not that, that tough, but he, he can pull tough, you know. What do you think about his races? Because he's pretty game, huh? You know what? Honestly, what these guys make me do every day, he works for him real good, you know? Work. Apparently, I can still walk a horse. Eric, you owe me 20 bucks. 20 bucks here. Yeah. Things I do for a Nancy. Huh? Racing continues this weekend at Santa Anita, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's closing weekend as we celebrate Father's Day on Sunday. We will have a special 12 o'clock post, a mandatory payout in the pick six. Do come and join us for our signature race. We'll have the possibly perfect and the one and only San Juan Capistrano. So we talked earlier in the podcast about what a feel-good story Aunt Jenna Antonucci and Archangelo were. And there was another pretty darn good story, again, on Met Mile Day uh, slash Belmont Stakes Day. That just wonderful card that the New York Race Association put together, including six grade one races of the undercard, clearly the Met Mile was the highlight of the afternoon for a number of reasons. I mean, we've known the Cody Dorman story before. I uh, got a lot of publicity, including on on the Breeders' Cup show, and uh, which Randy was a part of on NBC. But, you know, such a cool thing to see this horse win. And the story of the young man with, with the um, 
born with handicaps. Um, but let's look at the racing aspect of it. This is the best horse in the country. I, I don't, I'll see if I don't think either one of you want to disagree with me. I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to hear what you have to say. But, you know, he's just going out there and getting the job done every single time out. And this time he didn't have things go his own way. Uh, he broke slowly. He was last early and it was not at all a problem as he uh, got the job done quite uh, comfortably for trainer Bill Mata and Junior Alvarado. And one of the um, things that I, I thought that was the story after the race, Mata says the Whitney is a possibility, and that would be really exciting. He's kept this horse generally at a mile or shorter, uh, and he's had all this success. But, you know, could he go a mile eighth? Why not? I really hope they go in that race and, uh, you know, see what that would lead to if he wins the Whitney. But, uh, Randy, um, again, a very good horse on a roll. The other option they would have would be to go back and uh, and run in the forego and, tw- and try to win it again for the second straight year. But Mott already has uh, Judd Mott's elite power, mm-hmm. who won the True North on Friday, pointing for the forego. So why not take this horse and run him in the Whitney? You said he's had two chances around two turns in his career. His second lifetime start, he ran a mile and an eighth. And if you go back and watch the video of that race, he had no idea what he was doing. He was totally green. He was rank. He broke slowly like he's done a lot of times in his career. He just wasn't a polished racehorse. And then the second loss was in the Challenger at Tampa Bay. It's the only race he's lost in his last 10 starts. He was beaten by only a neck. But that was really before Cody's Wish began his ascent to become the kind of horse he is right now. You look at his pedigree. He's by curling out of a tappet mare. That's the two biggest stamina influences in American thoroughbred racing right now. Why would this horse not be able to handle a distance of ground? And certainly his running style would lead you to believe that extra distance would be no problem whatsoever. So, uh, Zoe, I'm like, Bill, I really look forward to seeing this horse run in the Whitney if that's what happens. Randy, don't yeah. forget he won the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile around two turns. So well, that's it, true. That was a, that was a two-turn race and not a one-turn race. You're right. So mm-hmm. that's further evidence about why they should stretch him out. Hey, he could be the next flight line. Uh, it's a terrific story. It's He's a terrific horse. The thing that really interested me from listening to Bill's comments was that he said he lo- loves to run the turn, and that is evident when you watch him run. Not many horses can sustain that big sweeping move that he has around the turn. Some horses love bull rings because they love to run the turns. He loves to run the turn, and that is why he's been so absolutely devastatingly brilliant around one turn now when he goes back to two turns obviously he's got two turns to run around so why wouldn't it be better but i don't know i mean he was pretty darn good in the in the breeders cup dirt mile uh terrific i mean he is for my for me the next flight line and we get a chance to see a whole lot more of him than we did a flight line High praise from Zoe Cabman about uh, the Met Mile winner, Cody's Wish. So um, we don't have time, but we could, you know, spend five hours on this podcast going over all the other races in the cards. So I'm going to cut it a little bit short and just ask, I think each of us will weigh in with what was our other highlight of the day. And mine was the Pennsylvania bred Caravelle. Congratulations to the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Angel of Empire dead heated for fourth in the Belmont. Didn't run badly, but didn't get uh, into the winner's circle. But Caravelle, the other big name Pennsylvania bred out there right now. I didn't think she had a prayer to beat Casa Creed. I loved Casa Creed in this race. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to win the race for the third straight year. I thought Caravelle was going to um, be a little bit uh, caught up in a possible speed duel. I didn't think that six furlongs was her best distance. I thought she was more than, you're shaking your head. So I'm just being honest here. <laughs> but that five and a half furlongs was her perfect distance. And boy, did she prove me wrong. She is so cool. And who doesn't like a filly who has raced uh, in her last four starts, three of them, have been against males, and she's won all three of them. In this niche dis, uh, category of turf sprints, she obviously has no equal, and I'm sure Brad Cox will uh, plot a course that will lead her to the Breeders' Cup and a uh, possible um, uh, repeat of that. So I have a question for you. Do we know yet? Will the Breeders' Cup turf sprint be six and a half down the hill at Santa Anita, or will it be run on the what they call the flat course? Do we know, Randy? I have a feeling it's... I have a feeling that's already been decided. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I'd be shocked if it was six and a half down the hill. Uh, I would expect it to be run like probably five and a, probably five and a half furlongs uh, on the flat, which they've been running for the last couple of years now. 
Yeah, I, I, that's what I think it's going to be. And, and Bella was a foreshadowing, the girl beating the boys. There you go. That, that was basically the foreshadowing of Belmont Stakes Day. It was all about the girls. Finally, <laughs> unlike this podcast, it's ladies <laughs> first. <laughs> All right, I wanted to mention Clarier talking about the ladies. Um, terrific. It's so cool to see her running this year when they could have easily retired her. She could have been a broodmare already, and it's it's giving us something to follow. She was absolutely phenomenal. As for Secret Oath, she didn't fire her best races that always at the beginning of the year. She can't seem to keep up with the workload, so to speak. But Clarier in the Ogden Phipps was just terrific. Uh, yeah, I mean, three cheers to, uh, you know, to Barbara Banky for keeping Clarier going. Uh, you could say the same thing uh, to Peter Brandt about Peter Brandt and in Italian who won the just a game on Friday. They're both five years old. You can say the same thing about Godolphin and Cody's Wish. A lot of a lot of outfits would have retired Cody's Wish to stud after winning the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile last year. But they thought they had more to gain by keeping him going. A lot to choose from here. I thought Clarier overcame uh, a slow pace and really, really ran well to win to beat search results. I'll go with up to the mark in the Manhattan. Uh, I think he is the best turf horse in America. Uh, he was good at a mile and a mile and a 16th. I think he was better at a mile and an eighth at Churchill Downs. And I think he's even better at a mile and a quarter at Belmont Park in the Manhattan. So it looks to me like the way this horse runs is running style he finished the Manhattan his last quarter in 23 and one going a mile and a quarter, which is uh, outstanding. I, I think he's more of a mile and a half Breeders' Cup turf prospect going forward than he would be a one mile prospect uh, going the other direction. But I think he's just um, a really, really nice horse who is uh, running exceptionally well right now. TD and Riders Room is also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. We've talked a lot the last few weeks about Angel of Empire, Pennsylvania bred. Why was he so close to the pace in the Belmont Stakes? I have no idea. But Caravelle, as Bill just pointed out, also a Pennsylvania bred. And when we talk about Caravelle, one thing that we haven't really touched on yet is the uh, is the fact that she was rerouted. Remember, initially, after winning at Churchill Downs, the plan, the erstwhile plan, was to send her to England to run in the King Stan Stakes at Royal Ascot. Well, Brad Cox called an audible, thought she'd be better off staying in the United States for the Jiper, and boy, what a big win she had here. So she is now on course, especially since the Jiper was a win in your end. She would have been on course anyway, though, for a repeat, for a chance at a repeat, of course, in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint November 4th at Santa Anita. We'll be right back after this message from the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six races for PA sired, PA bred two-year-olds at parks. Two $100,000 contests at five and a half furlongs. On August 21st, PA Day at the races. September 23rd, PA Derby Day has two races at six and a half furlongs, both with a $150,000 purse. And in December, two races going long, each worth $200,000. For more, go to pabred.com. Since the Belmont Stakes undercard Friday and Saturday, it was almost like a mini Breeders' Cup. It's no surprise that the fastest horse of the week came out of that weekend at Belmont Park. Which horse was it? We'll get to that in just a minute. Remember, fastest horse of the week is brought to you by the fast stallions at Windstar Farms, such as Global Campaign. His sire, Curlin, won the Woodward at age four. So did Global Campaign going wire to wire and earning a 104 buyer speed figure. He also ran the second fastest mile and an eighth ever in the Peter Pan stakes, earning uh, a big speed figure with a mile and an eighth and 146.71. He won six of his 10 starts, three graded stakes, four triple digit buyers. And also don't forget there's some pedigree there. He's a half brother for last year's leading first crop sire, Bolt Doro. Global Campaign's first yearlings will sell this summer. Now back to that fastest horse, no surprise, it's Cody's Wish. We've talked about him and what he did in the Metropolitan Handicap, the Met Mile. He also earned a buyer speed figure of 112 in that race, the fastest buyer of his career. So Cody's Wish not only continues to win from a speed figure perspective, he is going up and up and up. 
TD and Writers Room is brought to you by The Green Group, a tax accounting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry and especially specializing in saving you money on taxes. Welcome in now the Green Group Guest of the Week. No surprise here. It's who else but Jenna Antonucci, who's coming off that very memorable and historic win in the Belmont Stakes. Jenna, thanks for joining us. My first question is this. This race has become such a big deal for a lot of reasons. And I think one of the main reasons is because at a time when horse racing was having so many problems, this was a feel-good story that put a smile on everybody's face. And oh boy, did horse racing need that. Has that resonated with you? And what do you think about that? Uh, thanks, Bill, for having me. Uh, it's resonating more afterwards um, from probably a different point of view than might be initially thought um, from trainers that, you know, you're cordial with and you say hi to and, you know, it's everything's in passing at, at the speed of, the, of with which our industry goes, um, reaching out and just having nice and supportive, positive things to say. We often get a pretty, you know, bad wrath for not coming together as an industry or working together and having that camaraderie. Um, so from that point of view, um, I've been, I hear them, I'm appreciative of them and it's uh, having the respect of your peers is, I think it's nice and it's important in what we do to, to work forward in our industry and to work together and um, meeting some random people. I mean, literally went to Krispy Kreme this morning Yes, they were hot now. Like I had, it was just, it was just meant to be. So, and randomly, a couple of ladies were in there, and my best friend was getting something modified in her coffee, and it just kind of, ha the conversation just happened, and um, they were like, "You're, you're her. You're the one that. Oh my god!" And they were literally from Sweden in New York City, and were like starting to cry. I'm like, please don't cry. Please don't cry. Please don't cry. So <laughs> from that point of view, um, it's crazy, um, honestly. And, and I am, I'm so profoundly grateful and appreciative of a, this horse, um, and just to be able to steward him and to literally be on his tail strings, um, on, on all this is, is amazing. So we understand that in the wake of the Belmont, Jenna, you've actually had to get somebody to sort of be your press agent to deal with all the requests. <laughs> what has your life been like the last 72 hours? Honestly, Randy, I'm just trying not to screw up. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know, um, you know, there's obviously we have a business to run. It doesn't stop running. And I, I don't want to lose focus of making sure paying attention to the details of the horses that are in our care currently. And so um, leaning into um, the NTRA and Tom Rooney and Megan um, has been paramount. Um, Tiana, who happens to be my sister-in-law um, and has always done all of our social media and our website stuff, I just felt it was smart to take that half a step back and say, listen, I'm going to need help with some of this stuff because if we are as an industry given a little platform to, to, to talk about what we're doing and to talk about how we're trying to do things better. And, um, and this inspires some people to do better in and out of our industry than I just, I'm trying and I'm trying to just not screw it up. That's awesome. Jenna, you seem to have been just about, everywhere. I don't really follow Fox News. You're on Fox News. You're you're all over the place. And you've basically been an inspiration to people who may not have ever even heard of Jenna Antonucci, not heard of the Belmont Stakes. But I want to ask you, in the heat of the moment, you gave one of the best quotes I think anyone could ever give in the heat of the moment. If you can't find a seat at the table, find your own table. How did you come up with that after your horse just won the Belmont Stakes? How did you have the wherewithal to even think clear enough to say that? Did it just come to you naturally? You know, it's you eat a lot of poo when you're building in this industry. And, um, you know, you, you take it on the chin and and and, and that's not a complaint, um, you know, by any stretch. I'm, I'm quite fine taking some of those on, on the chin. And there have been plenty of opportunities that you yearn for. And again, not just in this industry. I think that's, I think the reason it's resonating is because it, it is across life where you, you see things through an optic, you see things through a point of view, you, you assume what those things may be that you are absorbing. And sure, there have been opportunities that I have wanted or that I have been 
asking for that the answers were no and no is two letters it, it doesn't define where you're going and what you're doing it's a no right now but it may be a yes later so handle yourself appropriately but if you're not happy with what's happening in your space don't be a victim to that and it's up to you to take ownership of that and to pivot and so i think in in the in the that moment you know it just metaphorically just literally can't, it wasn't scripted by any means i wish i was that smart to do those kind of things but you know, I, I'm such a stay in the moment person because the disappointment can be so profound and extreme in our industry. And you think you're going to hopefully do this and that, and then you, you get there mentally a little bit. And then all of a sudden you're like, that didn't happen. And I'll attribute golf. <laughs> I played a lot of golf before and you really have to stay present and in the moment for, you know, your, your cadence and your rhythm and your heartbeat and all those kinds of things. So I think it just kind of happened, Zoe, because it was just a, it's true. And it resonates with me. Um, and I've worked really hard over these last several years to make our own table and to work with people that I enjoy, not just in my team, but train other, um, pardon, other owners and the people that we have that have believed in me and have believed in us and what we do and putting good people around us and being okay to say no, um, that we're all kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, and so I think that's the, the root of it all. And also part of it is in that moment, yes, there was a little bit of vindication, you know, where we did it. Our team did it when you're told for so long, you can't have this and you can't have that. No, it's not your time and sit over there and get out of the way. And so just in that moment, it's like, no, here's our table. <laughs> we are not getting out of the way. Jen, I imagine one of the goals now is that you have horses of this caliber come into your barn fairly regularly. I mean, you might not get a grade one Belmont Stakes winner every year, but you want to move on, I would imagine, deal with good horses. What has this done for your career? What do you hope it will do for your career? Um, Bill, my, my focus is to deal with good people. Um, and, and with dealing with good people, good things will happen. And, and our focus will never change with that. Horses... We're going to do our best to steward the best possible outcomes for the horses that come in our hands. That's always been a core um, foundation of who I am as a person. I've said it from day one. I'll never train a million horses, but any horse that comes through our hands, we're going to do our absolute best to responsible decisions and steward the best possible outcomes we can, no matter what those outcomes are. And so my focus will be to continue to surround myself and our team with good people so that we are having fun and we are enjoying this experience and we are doing our best to show the best in horse racing. I just wish I could get my golf game going to where it's just a fraction <laughs> as successful as you winning the Belmont States. <laughs> uh, from what I understand, from what I've read in the not so distant past, you were training retired thoroughbreds for a new career in the, in the hunter jumper business and such. How, and maybe more importantly, why did you go from that to being a full-time trainer of thoroughbred racehorses? Because I must be a little bit insane. Um, there was the um, perception of the lack of um, politics in racing. Um, I can honestly say at this point, I definitely um, oversent that idea a little bit. But what I will say is um, on the racetrack, there, um, there is no politics when they're running. And when those horses are giving you everything, that is, that is pure. And that is amazing for me. But my initial drive um, for that, Randy, was just I wanted to better retrain thoroughbreds for their next careers. I wanted to understand the breaking and training process, why when we were asking them to go left, they wanted to go right, why when I was asking for a lead change, they thought my leg was a fly on their side. You know, just some of the random little nuances that are so important for when they go on to become a show horse or a pleasure horse, you know, they have to reassimilate and they have to find a new normal. And so I was hungry for that knowledge and that experience so that I could help them transition more quickly and not have, you know, those hiccups of not understanding why and what. And I just honestly got bit by the speed um, and the adrenaline and the sheer athleticism and who they are. And they're just so smart that it was like, ooh, this is, this is kind of okay. I, I think I like this a lot. 
Jenna, can you explain to me your approach a, a little bit more? Horse forward, horseology, your farm in Ocala, and, and some of your team that helps you, because I know Fiona Goodwin and Katie Miranda are a big part of this. They are. And it's, you know, the horse, I think everyone's kind of learning what horse forward means. I'm not a race chaser. Yes, there's condition books and there's stakes and and those are goals. And we're going to back into those. We're going to set breeze schedules based around them. But if we're going to miss them, we're going to miss them. And, you know, hopefully we're not missing the big stage and we didn't miss it this week. Um, so it's very much, you know, slow down a minute and listen to the horse, you know, look at their eye read them, listen to their body language. As you know, Zoe, they never stop talking. They're so chatty. There's so much personality. You know, if we're missing something in a personality, if something isn't coming out where the horse is just, you know, nonstop chattering at you, why? What are we missing? What can we do? Um, are we missing anything soundness wise? Do we need to find a chiropractor for this, this fella? Is there something that's just, just not right with this one? And so that's really the foundation and the core is to join with these horses and teach these horses and let them find their full personality. And we feel strongly that if you're allowing that to happen, then whatever level they're going to be, you're going to maximize. And it may be that 12 claimer and it may be a grade one horse, but if they're a happy horse, they're going to give you everything they have. Jen, I think your second best quote during all this is there is no politics when they are running. You've, you're you're good at this um, coming up with uh, really uh, germane statements for uh, capturing the moment. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the horse. One of the other things that made it a little guy does well story is the yearling price, 35000 You're facing off against a horse that costs $1.3 million in Tampa Trice. Not at all unusual to see the seven-figure horses in there. How involved were you in the, in the purchase of him, and, and what was the story that he sold for so little at the sales? I was not involved. Um, John Ebert did um, did the buying of his horse. He um, He's a guy that just kind of flutters around the sale and in obscurity likely not going to be so obscure now. Um, but he, um, I, I laugh, the horses that we have from all quite quirky, they all have a different personality. And it became, it became a thing of like, oh no, what has he found now? And what kind of, you know, quirkiness are we going to have to deal with? So I just think, um, Bill, that it was at a time where Arrogate was still alive. Uh, I think I have that, that fact, right. And it was, shall we dare say the hump year, nothing had started running yet. No one knew, no one knew we wouldn't have him anymore. And he was the sum of a lot of parts. Um, he initially went to Clovis Crane for the first couple of months before coming down to us. And um, he just was a big kid. You know, that unbridled song, you know, thread that comes through there. He has a little bit of a lighter build, shall I say, just with a little bit more refinement and how he carries himself across the racetrack where Arrogate was a bit heavier of a horse and hit the ground a little bit harder with when he ran. So I think from that regard, it's a huge asset to this horse that he has some of that arrogate brilliance um, and that speed and obviously the stamina aspect coming um, through the, the tap it and the unbridled side, unbridled song side. So in, uh, in doing my Jenna Antonucci, Antonucci research, I, can't, I, I believe, oh you can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> there was only one other time in your career where you have trained a horse to run a mile and a half or further on dirt. It was in the Birdstone Stakes back in 2014, long time ago. Long time ago. So when you're, so, so when you're getting this horse ready to run a mile and a half, coming off the <laughs> Peter Pan, is the cake basically baked at that point, so to speak? Uh, I mean, he didn't breeze again for 18 days after the Peter Pan, which is pretty normal. Uh, you know, what did you do or is anything you really could do to get this horse up to the mile and a half performance or was all the work already done? I think at this point, um, you're not going to put an extra half a mile of fitness underneath a horse. That's just not going to happen. You know, I'm not, cha I'm not training jump horses and steeplechase horses. And, you know, we're not going to go out and gallop three miles a day. And, and, and I don't think when you're going a mile and a half, you want that kind of training under a horse. You still need that, you know, rapid fire, short, um, muscle to work. Um, the turn of foot that he shows is in him, so I do think, you know, as fit as they are, you know, he ran a mile and an eighth well. He overcame a pace in there well. He galloped out big as well. Um, we increased our daily gallop a little bit. Um, and again, horses only have a certain amount of mileage in them, just like a car. And so we had such a big foundation already in place with him. 
it was just making sure we had just that little bit more. So I probably wanted to make sure we maybe had a 16th more in him or an eighth more in him. And that was why we designed our breeze the way that we did. And we did our, what ended up being a timed open gallop for him a few days prior was just as a lung opener for him and, um, him just finding his cadence. And that was literally the last thing that I told, um, Javier, you know, it's, and we talked about it the day before, it's just find a rhythm with him. And I do think there's an element when you're going that far that a horse wants it or not. Yes. The fitness clearly has to be there, obviously, but there's a desire and a want at that point. Cause they are all fatiguing at that point, no matter how fit they are. And so for us, it wasn't a huge pivot and a shift for him. It may have just been fine tuning a couple of things for him. Jenna, was, was there a concern? Because wasn't one of his final breezes kind of unplanned? He was supposed to just do it lick and he just whizzed around there. How did it, you feel? Like the after media ran that? with that one. We thought it was hilarious and how they were interpreting it. Um, if you look at Robert um, and the picture that was taken that day, like we totally busted his chops about it because it, it wasn't that – you know, he, he can be very forward when he trains, um, his workout pattern is there. We didn't need a 59 breeze in this horse going a mile and a half. And so it was literally a two minute lick day. And, um, Archangelo's two minute lick happens to be um, a little quicker than other people's idea of a two minute lick. So, you know, it was, um, just meant to be exactly what it was. I think everyone got a little ruffled about it that's fine. Um, that's on them, not on me. He came, I was on the pony, came back to the backside and Robert was like, just shaking his head. I'm like, you're killing me smalls. I'm like, I'm going to get so lit up for this. I'm like, but it is what it is. And, um, he needed that. Um, Javier's breeze beforehand was exactly what Javier needed for that day. And I needed to make sure that I could put the saddle on him on Saturday. So that was why we did what we did. Cause we were getting a little, um, you know, a little sharp, a little early. So I wanted him to, yeah, take a breath there, guy. Jenna, you, you mentioned that he can be a little bit quirky and that John Ebert buys quirky horses. Can you expound on that a little bit? And how did you meet John? What, were you whistling at him at Keeneland? Not I read him. a story of No, not yeah. him. Katie not was him. whistling for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> they were we were in the back ring watching something come up and Katie was trying to get my attention from across the back ring at Keeneland. And she whistled and he happened to be standing next to her. And he was like, hey, whoa, like, you know, come on now. And and it, there was some a level of sarcasm that threaded through. And um, it was just one of those things where John was like, oh, my God, I think I found my people, you know, and it just evolved from there. And um, John's had his own experiences in, in the industry. And I'm super grateful that we fit um, what he was looking for. And it just seems to have been the right time. And the powers to be above us, you know, kind of letting all things and synergies come together. As far as the quirkiness in Archangelo, um, he's a big personality. And I think it's super important for horses with big personalities to show them. Um, when we try and compartmentalize them too much to make ourselves comfortable, I think we dampen them. And you can dampen their spirit and their fight in them. So, He's a round pen guy twice a day. I know people sometimes get like horrified. Oh my God, something could happen. I promise you, if I leave that horse in the stall and don't let him have his round pen time, something's going to happen. And so, you know, we take all the necessary safety precautions and whatnot, but he needs his time to have his space and to be able to get out some of that kid energy and just be in his own space for, for some time each day. He usually goes out there at least twice a day to, to be as much of a horse as possible. And you know, he's just quirky. You know, it's, he wants to have the time to stand on the track and to look around and to take it all in and make sure someone doesn't want to take a picture of him. He's just knows he's pretty. And he's just that guy a little bit. And uh, he gets <laughs> like, he Randy. Gets, just like Randy, just, just, yes, like, like just like Randy. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard you mention Jenna uh, several times now that this is an example of how many horsemen and horsewomen out there can succeed if given the opportunity with the right horse. I've heard you talk about how owners and uh, racing managers tend to overemphasize win percentage of trainers, among other things. And you had a funny story about a conversation with a handicapper who didn't know he was talking to you referencing win percentage. Can you kind of tell us about all that a little bit? Um, you know, I've, I've spent probably my lifetime 
um, going against the current and not on purpose, just trying to see past the BS sometimes. And um, I don't like for anyone's voices to be silenced. And I don't like for anyone to feel like they're not relevant and they're not important. And that's something that, you know, I see everybody, you know, I'm grateful for every single person that works on that racetrack, whether they're a security guy, someone picking up garbage, someone, whatever they're doing, they're, they're doing the best they can in their capacity and without them, the rest of it doesn't work. And so I think that's just something that I've always pulled forward. You know, the, the, the sacrifice and the commitment that a lot of our help gives to provide for their families, you know, whether they're here on a visa program and they don't, are not with their families all the time, that sacrifice is just something that is profound to me, you know, that this is, this is how they're making it happen in their space. And so, um, I probably sense it a little hard, um, with Steve Beck yesterday on, on that, but I do think people need to, to own their space and be more accountable. And, you know, I think agents, you know, they're, they're doing their best to get money into the business and investors and owners in here, and they don't want to be wrong. And they're, oh, if I'm, if I'm wrong, I may lose this guy and this guy might go somewhere else. And when we start making fear-based decisions, we make bad decisions. And, you know, we need to be able to sell our sport to new people in a way that isn't just a, um, a percentage. You know, it's not rocket science. If I have one runner and the big guy has five runners, if I lose one, it's going to take me an entire racing cycle to try and overcome the loss on a percentage. It's basic math. This isn't anything cosmic. And so I think we continue to do our industry a huge disjustice by put, trying to use that number as the great equalizer. And that's up to people above my pay grade to figure out how to, um, to represent the middle guy better, you know, whether it's doing a different tiered system of p- people with this amount of starts, you know, here's a statistic for them and people with this many starts, here's a statistic for them. But we don't have the luxury of sending the million dollar horse to a B-level track to get the win, to erase the three other losses. And, and that's just reality. It's not just my reality. It is the reality of our industry. And it is continually what puts us behind the eight ball and the perception of, Listen, I know the big guys. They've been wonderful to me. I don't have a disparaging thing to say about any of them. They've been gracious through all this. They've all reached out and they have their place and their place is very important, but a healthy industry needs a middle market and it needs the Monday through Friday um, runners to be able to have the Saturday runners. And we can make it different. And it's every single person contributing to that and bloodstock guys and gals and, and whatnot being brave enough to be wrong if they're wrong. But how horses go on once they leave certain barns or if they're claimed or do they not go on and, and seeing the backside and seeing people, how they handle themselves and how they handle their barns and whatnot. That's how we continue to improve it and give the, the non, the non designer label an opportunity. And as you've been on the uh, the Jenna Antonucci media tour the last the last three days with uh, with outlets like Fox that may not know much of it, if anything, about horse racing, is there one single overriding message that you're trying to deliver to people watching that may not know all that much about the sport? It's amazing, um, and it's full of amazing people. And I'm very aware, and we'll talk about the taboo topic. I, I, I don't have a problem talking about it, you know, breakdowns and fatalities. And I very clearly understand that um, the general public views our industry as we're profiting from horses and we're killing them. Like, let's be honest, right? That's that's the thread that we are all trying to navigate and do better with. So um, if we aren't telling our story and if we aren't sharing with people how we're doing better, whether you want to lean into HISA or not, um, we have to, we have to, and we are, we are doing better and we will continue to do better. And it's setting realistic expectations, um, and, and educating people on what amazing things happen and what amazing lives these horses have and how much they enrich life for so many people. And it's not just about chasing a trophy or a win percentage and putting more color in what we do and not such a black and white sterile, um, starchy response to everything, because I think that's very, um, disenfranchising for people and it makes us look like we don't care. And that couldn't be further from the truth. 
Jenna, I, I just have one more on a brighter note. I can remember talking to you in March at the OBS sale. And you were there with Manny and we're chatting away and you're like, oh, yeah, the big horse. And I'm like, who's the big horse? And you're like, you looked at me like I was crazy. You're like, Archangelo. And I'm like, Christ, I don't know who this guy is. So you're like, well, we're going to run in the Peter Pan, Zoe. All right. And I'm like, okay, okay. So we had a good chat about him and you were telling me about you know, how amazing he was and everything. And then I walked off and I'm Googling. I'm like, Archangelo. I'm like, oh, he just broke his maiden. Okay, great. You're like, we're going to run in the Peter Pan. What a plan to come together. He broke his maiden in March. You run in the Peter Pan. You had a plan. So how exactly did you feel watching that big baby cross the wire in front in the Belmont Stakes? Can you just Take us through how you felt when you were screaming and just, just saw him get the lead. You must have thought I was crazy in March, I and that's okay. But you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta swing, and that you know that was part of what you know I said in the coming days too. Is like they're gonna expect me to be wrong. I mean, I have like the hall pass to swing away. Oh, it didn't happen. No big deal. You know, move over here again. So like, really, I had the hall pass. I had nothing to lose to try it and to do it, even with the Peter Pan and even coming forward to the Belmont Stakes and. John is extremely involved in our path. And, you know, after we broke our maiden, I sent him the next 90 days um, of stake opportunities from obscurity to the big stage. And it was, if this doesn't happen here, 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 you know, it was just all the if scenarios because in managing business, that's the other part of this, you know, it's just finding all your, what you have to do. And um, it just was the right move for this horse and this time. Um, and that's how we got there. And it was the great ask, you know, we weren't going to duck anybody. I, I'm not a ducker. Like if we're in the gate, let's do this. And so it just, I think happened a bit naturally. Um, didn't want to hard commit to things because I wanted the horse to have the breathing room he needed if we felt he needed more time. And, um, playing the woman card, just kidding, you know, being non-committal, um, total joke, total joke. Um, but just wanting to give the breathing room to this horse to let him be him. And I know that sounds just so fundamental, but it really was. And he did great. Obviously Javier continued to learn about the Colt, um, through the Peter Pan. And, um, I think the part of the film that I look a little insane on, um, when, it was when the rail opened. Um, I think one of the, the, the details that hasn't been talked about is the rail was a bit dead um, Belmont day. And so we traveled most of our trip on a dead rail, which is crazy to me. And um, Johnny just fanning those guys wide like he should do. He knew a horse was behind him, but he didn't know which horse was over there. And when he fanned them, that's that's the video clip when I went because it was like, Oh my God, are you kidding me? It was like, Oh, here you go. And, and so that's when we went crazy. <laughs> Our plan was to take the jump on them. We knew we had, um, a longer sustained run than most others do. And we knew we had a high cruising speed. Like that's not a secret. Everyone knew that. So yes, our plan was to get the jump and, um, Javier had the plan of, you know, getting in front and putting his horse in front of everybody and making them come around us if they needed, if they could. And so my, my lack of connection to reality and that stretch run was just the fact that it actually, we got a rail trip, cut the corner and got a jump on. It was like, Holy crap, it worked. And then just, you know, go buddy, go and Javier, you better ride your tail off my friend. And, and he did. And, you know, the rest is, I guess, literally history. <laughs> Jenna, one more question before I let you go, because we've left out the most one of the most important topics of this whole story. How big a deal is it to you and how important is the whole female issue, the first to win not only the Belmont Stakes, but a triple crown race? Um, thanks for that, Bill. It's it's a um, I'm the benefactor of an amazing horse. And with whatever opportunity that throws my way, 
my job is to continue to steward this horse and any horse. Um, and if it gives me a little sliver to help steward the sport and to a better, healthier direction and to share our story, um, then I feel in any industry that you're in, you should always give back to the industry. Um, and so part of obviously my, my big part of, of aftercare and advocating that is just a corner of who, of who I am with everything. And so I think it's a, um, that's what it means to me. And if it makes a little girl dig a little harder and try a little harder and, and get, you know, a shot in the chin and continue to move on, then, then I'll own that space. Um, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I'm, I'd rather be at the farm where it's quiet, but that's fine. And, and I'll find my footing with, with all of that. But we have a responsibility to not only the sport, but to the horses to continue to work hard for them because they give us everything. What we do is an absolute privilege and, and a blessing. Yeah, I would say that was absolutely great stuff and much appreciated. I know you're getting on um, everybody and Fox and CNN and everybody's pulling at you in a bunch of different directions. So thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule. And uh, again, congratulations on a wonderful victory. It was good news for horse racing. Isn't that nice? Thanks so much, Jenna Antonucci. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Randy. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Jenna Antonucci will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from the Green Group. For more information on what the Green Group can do for you, go to www.greenco.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes with some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round. There's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky breads, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. Eight of the nine Belmont Stakes runners were Kentucky breads, including the winner Archangelo, bred by the Don Alberto Corporation, Chilean based, but also now with the farm in Kentucky. Remember this, three different horses won the Derby Preakness in Belmont this year, three different last year, three different in 2021. All nine of those horses were Kentucky Breds. Kentucky Breds also swept both grade ones on Friday, five of the six grade ones on Saturday, with Caravelle, the Pennsylvania Bred, being the only exception. You can find your next Kentucky Bred, Zoe will be there, at this week's OBS June sale. Well, there were a couple off-track stories during the week, and I want to start with one that involved Linda Rice. Uh, you probably know the background of that. She was suspended originally for, or not suspended, they were going to revoke her license in New York Gaming Commission for three years, alleging that she was getting uh, uh, favorable treatment from the racing office at Naira, that they were telling her which horses were in races, and then uh, she was being able to pick her spots here and there. Uh, some allegations that she was paying for this information, she uh, disputed that. Well, they, they went to court, and boy, did the court come down heavily on Linda Rice's side, calling the uh, suspension entirely unwarranted. And if you read the uh, decision from, it was an appeals court, federal appeals court, that basically they came to the conclusion that, you know, everybody was getting some information. And, you know, they want to say, well, you could tell them this about a race, but you couldn't tell them that. 
And then uh, they brought in PJ Campo, the racing secretary. He said this was no big deal. And then Martin Panza, who was director of racing at the time, uh, contradicted him. So you had two former Naira executives giving um, different stories. But, you know, we, we've seen a pattern from the New York Gaming Commission where they've just been too heavy handed, um, you know, the, where they suspended the, the clock of Richie Gazer. Uh, for doing absolutely nothing. And they got uh, slapped around pretty good by the court. Uh, Linda Rice likely will still have to pay a, a fine of $50,000. So it's not like she was, you know, uh, completely pristine and pure in this. Um, you know, there were some allegations that maybe they took this thing too far. But it amounted to much ado about nothing, and Linda Rice wins big. You know, this is Ladies' Day. We talked to Jinta <laughs> Antonucci, Caravelle beat the boys. Zoe, you go first here. I, I think it's I think it's great. Uh, they finally made the right call because, I mean, anyone knows you, you call the racing office, they'll come and hustle you to run a horse in a race. This stuff goes on everywhere. And you, you'll know, you'll talk to a jocks agent. Hey, is so-and-so going in here? Is so-and-so going in there? It happens. And for them to make such, such a big deal over it, just because Linda was the leading trainer at the time, get over it. Uh, they they did make the right decision for sure. So good for Linda, and yes, she will have to pay a fine, and she has no problem with that. Uh, you know, the court also ventured into the the area of whether or not her gender had something to do with this. I I don't think it did, but the court said not to be overlooked is that the petitioner is the only trainer ever disciplined by the respondent for this rules violation. A troublesome point given that the petitioner is the only female trainer ever to win a training title at a New York track. Okay, so off track news, Linda Rice had a good week. Kent DeZarmo did not. Uh, the story broke on Saturday. It came up on the uh, CHRB, California Horse Racing Board website, that uh, DeZarmo going forward is going to have to uh, conduct a breathalyzer test every single day before he gets on horses in the morning, before he rides horses in the afternoon. And uh, the reason is because uh, we learn now that he failed a breathalyzer test at Santa Anita on March 31st. Um, it's sad. Uh, it looked like, you know, we've heard it a dozen times out of him, but once again, it looked like maybe he had gotten things under control but apparently that is not necessarily the case. I feel bad for him, but at some point, I mean, it's not three strikes you're out, it's 12 strikes you're out uh, in, in his case. I do think if he fails a breathalyzer test uh, that, that he's going to have to uh, uh, be uh, held to, that it probably would be the end of his career. I don't hope for that. I hope for him to get his act together but um, this was not a uh, good moment for Kent DeZarmo. And obviously the, uh, the troubles are, are, you would think are still with him. I could argue the fact he's actually had a very good weekend. He had two three day win days this weekend. That, that happened back in March. He was taken off his mount that day. He was back the next day and no one, no one really knew what was going on. And it's all to do with due process. And they had to go through the process and decide what they're going to do with him, the CHRB. I, I don't really know anything about it, but in the interim, he's been exemplary. So I, I don't know how many strikes he's got. Uh, I, I don't know. I'd assume that this would have been the last one, but he's back. He's working horses and he's riding terrifically. So if he's allowed to go on, I'm, I'm not going to be make judgment on that whatsoever. That's not my call. But he is riding terrifically. Yeah. Most of what I don't understand about this whole thing is just it's a it's it's a common refrain nowadays in horse racing. It's just the administrative part of this. OK, if if the California Horse Racing Authorities believe that if he fails a breathalyzer test, he then poses a danger to the other jockeys and to himself if he's riding and needs to be just immediately uh, put on ice. He failed a breathalyzer test in April and they didn't get around to this ruling until June. And in the meantime, he's been riding on a regular basis and as Zoe pointed out, winning. Uh, why a two month delay? I, I it, The whole thing is just I don't want to say bizarre, but it's, it's, it's just very, very unusual. I, I would love to see him get his act back together, obviously. He's 53 years old. The fact that he has a drinking problem and he's still winning races the way he's winning, he's winning just points out, you know, what a talented rider 
I can't disarmo actually is, but this whole thing to me just smells of Pat Valenzuela uh, all over again. And you'd like to be optimistic, but at this point, it's uh, it's becoming tougher and tougher and tougher to be optimistic. Thanks, BTV. Work of the week is Arabian Night. We mentioned him earlier, so let's take a look at that half mile work. This was going in forty seven and two last Saturday at Santa Anita, and his most serious work yet. On his way back to the races, Arabian Knight was an impressive winner on the Breeders' Cup undercard and ran his record to a perfect two for two in the Southwest Stakes for trainer Bob Baffert, the son of Uncle Mo, is targeting the Haskell per Bob Baffert. And this was an absolutely terrific work. We'll be right back after this message from XPTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. TDN Riders Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point partnership can launch you into the winner's circle and give you instant camaraderie with your fellow owners. Parnak, the French bed filly that we talked about last week, ended up winning on Sunday at Belmont for trainer Christophe Clement. That gives West Point 32 wins on the year. This weekend, they have Mount Up looking to break his maiden at Belmont. He was a $400,000 yearling buy and was second on debut last October. Is now coming in off the layoff for Todd Pletcher, West Point Stable, Vinny Viola St. Elias Stable, and Rob Masiello. Well, that is a wrap on another edition of the TDN Writers Room, a post-Belmont edition. I want to thank my cohorts, Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman. Special shout out and thanks Jenna and Antonucci, uh, just a terrific interview and uh, nice of her to take some time out when um, she's being pulled by every media outlet in the country, it seems, but good for her. Also, our co-producers, Katie Petruniak, Anthony LaRocca, our editors, Leah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson, and I know uh, Lucy must be back there somewhere, Randy, right? There you go. She's out. All right. <laughs> That's a wrap, everybody. We'll talk to you next week.